Hi guys and welcome back to episode 3 of the carbon cycle and energy security unit over here on my channel. Today we're going to be looking at carbon sequestration. It's a big topic so grab your books, grab your notes and let's get going. The biological carbon pump. It can take millions of years for carbon to move through the carbon cycle between rocks, soil, rivers, oceans and the atmosphere. Each year no more than 100 million tonnes moves through this slow cycle. However, one part of the cycle moves faster. At the surface of the ocean there is always an exchange of carbon dioxide. Some dissolves into the water and some, be and some is vented out to the air above. This is known as the biological carbon pump. 15 gigatons of carbon is transferred from the atmosphere to the deep ocean each year. How the biological carbon pump works? The ocean surface layer contains tiny phytoplankton, also known as microalgae. In some ways they are similar to terrestrial plants. They contain chlorophyll and need sunlight to live. They also have shells and sequester, take up carbon dioxide through photosynthesis creating calcium carbonate as their shells develop. Then, when they die, these carbon-rich microorganisms sink to the ocean floor and remain there, accumulating as sediment. This particular process is known as, as the carbonate pump and is part of the biological carbon pump. It is crucial because it pumps CO2 out of the atmosphere into the ocean store. Without the contributions of phytoplankton, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere would be far higher than it already is. This is a naturally efficient system, but it is also fragile. Phytoplankton require nutrients in vast quantities, and existing ocean temperatures and currents ma maintain a constant supply. The recycling of particles that sink in deep waters by upwelling currents is crucial. The global movement of water through the thermaline circulation maintains the pump. However, slight changes in water temperature can alter the flow. Pollution and turbulence also reduce light penetration and slow the pump down. Each of these factors is vulnerable to climate change, making the risk of the pump breaking down a real one. Is the Gulf Stream failing? During 2004, there was some alarm amongst ocean and climate scientists when the northeasterly Atlantic current, known as the Gulf Stream, appeared to stall for 10 days. Those monitoring ocean temperatures became concerned that the current was slowing, and indeed data showed that the speed of ocean circulation between the Gulf of Mexico and Europe had slowed by 30% since 2000. The scientists' hypothesis for the cause was as follows. Meltic, melting Arctic ice was increasing the amount of fresh water entering the North Atlantic, the ocean's salinity was declining as a result, preventing cold water from sinking there. This meant that there was nowhere for the warm water of the Gulf Stream to go. The North Atlantic was losing its pulling effect. By investigating this hypothesis, research since 2004 has suggested that the Gulf Stream has slowed by 6 million tonnes of water per second over 12 years. Terrestrial stores Terrestrial, land-based, primary producers sequester carbon through the process of photosynthesis, just as the phytoplankton does in the ocean. Primary producers and consumers In terrestrial ecosystems, carbon is found in plants, animals, soils and microorganisms, such as bacteria and fungi. Leaves, roots, dead material, decaying litter and brown organic residues in soil all contain carbon. The exchange of carbon between plants and the atmosphere is rapid. Green plants are primary producers that use solar energy to produce biomass. Plant growth on land and algae and phytoplankton in water. CO2 is absorbed and converted into new plant growth during photosynthesis. As plants grow, they release CO2 into the atmosphere through respiration. Organisms known as primary consumers Bugs, beetles, larvae and herbivores depend and feed on producers and return carbon to the atmosphere during respiration. In turn, organisms such as insects, worms and bacteria feed on dead plants, animals and waste and are therefore known as biological decomposers. The role of trees. The role of vegetation depends on water, nutrients and sunlight. 
95% of a tree's biomass, the leaves, branches, branches, trunk and roots, is made up from the CO2 that it sequesters and converts into cellulose, a carbon compound. Carbon fixation turns gaseous carbon, CO2, into living organic compounds that grow. The amount of carbon stored within a tree, woodland or forest, depends on the balance between photosynthesis photosynthesis and respiration, mangroves and the role of soil. Biological carbon can be stored in soils in the form of dead organic matter or returned back to the atmosphere as a result of, as a result of decomposition. Depending on the nature of the soil, this process can be relatively quick, a few years, or as in tundra soils, very slow. But deforestation and land use changes can, res can release carbon stores very rapidly as mangroves show. Mangrove forests are found along tropical and subtropical tidal coasts in Africa, Australia, Asia and the Americas. They are vital processes, sequestering almost 1.5 metric tonnes of carbon per hectare every year. Mangrove soils consist of thick organic layers of litter, hummus and peat which contain high levels of carbon, over 10%. Undisturbed, mangroves grow quickly and absorb large amounts of carbon. Submerged below high tides twice a day, their soils are anaerobic, that is, without oxygen. Bacteria and microbes cannot survive without oxygen, so the decomposition of plant matter is slow. As a result, little of the carbon can be respired back to the atmosphere, and the stores remain intact. Any plant matter trapped by tree roots tends to stay as it decomposes slowly, and may remain stored for thousands of years. However, if mangroves are drained or cleared, carbon is released back to the atmosphere. Throughout the tropical world, mangroves have been cleared for tourism, shrimp farms and aquaculture. According to Malaysian research, if just 2% of the world's mangroves are lost, the amount of carbon released will be 50 times the natural sequestration rate. Tundra soils. Much of the soil in the tundra region is permanently frozen and contains ancient carbon. Microbe activity is only active in the surface layer of the soil when it thaws. The rest of the time, the roots and dead and decayed organic matter are frozen, locking any carbon into an icy store. Tundra soils contain carbon that has been trapped for hundreds of thousands of years. Tropical forests add as carbon stores. Tropical rainforests are huge carbon sinks, but they are fragile and can disappear quickly. Carbon within rainforests is mainly stored in trees, plant litter and dead wood. Soils are relatively thin and lacking in nutrients because litter layers that cover them, though very deep, decompose rapidly and the nutrients released are rapidly consumed by vegetation. As the litter and dead wood decay, they are recycled so quickly that a store does not develop. Even carbon given off by decomposers is rapidly recycled. Tropical rainforests absorb more atmospheric CO2 than any other terrestrial biome accounting for 30% of global net primary production, although they cover just 17% of the Earth's surface. If they all died off, the world would lose a massive carbon sink. And that is the end of episode three of this series. I hope you got something from it. I hope you could kind of try and get your head around carbon sequestration. I know it's a bit more of a difficult topic, but nevertheless, I hope you enjoyed. Next week, we're gonna be looking at a balanced carbon cycle. So stick around, subscribe down below so that you don't miss that. I upload one of these every Monday at 4.30 p.m. So subscribe down here. I'll link the playlist up here for the rest of them and I will see you next week. Bye guys.